All right, here we go. Uh, next to last, our, our penultimate talk of the day. Um, Harnor Minhas is from Detroit, Michigan. Harnor is a senior data engineer, AWS certified solution architecture, uh, developer, DevOps admin, and a cloud and technology enthusiast at Quicken Loans, the nation's largest mortgage lender, which is based in Detroit. Harnor has more than 15 years of diverse work experience working in various sectors, including banking, securities, finance, education, tax, regulatory, private, state, and federal government. Today, he's gonna to take us from zero to machine learning in just 45 minutes. Uh, when was the last time you attended a machine learning presentation and walked out saying, that was really good and I got it? Uh, Harnor is gonna take us through an exciting journey of machine learning, after which he guarantees you that you'll be able to be pumped, that you will be pumped have clarity and know exactly, uh, <clears throat> and we'll know exactly how you can implement that yourself. So if everyone could give it up uh, for Harnor. Har Harnor, go ahead and share your screen. We're glad to have you. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to From Zero to Machine Learning in 45 Minutes. Uh, so I'll be taking questions at the end, so, but if you guys have come up with any, any questions, like they mentioned, keep on putting them in and I'll answer them all at the end of the presentation. Like like you mentioned, my name is Harnoor Minhas and I'm a senior data engineer. A little bit about myself. I love technology, especially cloud technology. I've worked a lot for the past 12 years. I've worked exclusively with the data warehouse and cloud technologies, machine learning. Also, I like playing video games. Uh, if you want to talk, let's talk. I'm a little bit into cryptocurrency as well, but please do yourself a favor and don't ask me for any financial advice on that. Uh, my email address is harnoorminhas at quickenloans.com. You can also find me on LinkedIn and connect with me. I'll be, like I said, I'll be willing to answer any of your questions at the end. You can email me your questions and you can also reach out on LinkedIn. So who here wants to learn machine learning? I'm assuming everyone's like, yeah, me. Okay, awesome, great. So you're in the right session. So what are we gonna learn today? So we'll go a little bit over what is artificial intelligence and machine learning? What are the different types of machine learning? Uh, we'll talk about, go through a few examples of how machine learning is used in the industry. And then we go a little deeper into reinforcement machine learning, which is also one of my favorites, by the way. Then we'll learn how to create our own reinforcement machine learning model using a little bit of Python. And in the end, you'll see how the model actually works. And trust me, you'll be able to do it yourself. If you think it's too hard, don't, don't. I, I used to think the same. Uh, so I might use the word ML, machine learning interchangeably, just means machine learning. So you might think that machine learning is only limited to a handful of companies or, you know, like very complicated things like uh, DNA sequencing, robotics, etc. But if I tell you it's actually everywhere around you, Google search, Siri, Google Voice, Alexa, if you use Spotify, they're actually using machine learning to identify which ads to play for you. If you use a credit card using used for real-time fraud checks and all that, if you use Facebook or Instagram, they're trying to identify ads to show you so, so you ha they have a high likelihood of you actually buying something. If you step down, I don't know, Washington DC, there are facial recognition cameras identifying criminals real time. There are chances you might have used a smart elevator. So you get it, it's all around you. But how do computers gain this knowledge or this machine learning? How does it work? So it's, uh, it comes from a basic concept called artificial intelligence. This is how computers learn. Artificial means something that's not natural, and intelligence is the ability to acquire and apply knowledge and skills. So, for example, you might have played a game of chess or Tetris on a PC or your phone. That's artificial intelligence. It has learned some, it has some predefined things that it knows how to do, and does a pretty good job of that. Uh, another example could be a robot, which is programmed to walk on a simple, on a solid surface, right? But now what is machine learning? Machine learning is a subset of AI where now your program or your machine is automatically learning on its own without explicitly being programmed to do a specific thing. What do I mean? So think of the same robot now. 
just add, so let's take our robot, add some sensor to it, right? Let's add some cameras, let's add some gyroscope to it. So now it has the ability to get more feedback from the environment. Then it actually takes the feedback and tries to learn from it. So now you can take your robot and make it try, try to make it walk on the grass or snow. It's gonna struggle initially, but over time it learns how to do it. So that's what kind of is machine learning. And I, all right. So talking of uh, video games, like I mentioned, I like playing video games. Here's a picture of a mouse eating a cake. But why is there a picture of a mouse eating a cake? Uh, that's actually my gamer tag, mouse eating cake. My daughter came up with this and I could just, just stuck with it. But going back to the picture, did you have to struggle for a second to see, think that's a mouse, that's a piece of cake and the mouse is eating a cake? No, right? So that brings me to how do we learn these things? So since your childhood, you've been exposed to multiple things like pictures of animals, pictures of things. You've gone to the zoo, seen animals. You've interacted with things in your real life. So over time, your brain actually learns these things without you having to explicitly train those things. So let me show you this picture for instance. Is this a mouse or a rat? That's not a trick question, by the way. Yeah, it is a mouse or a rat. But if I were to ask you, what's your confidence level? I would say, 90 to 95%, some might say 60%, right? Uh, how about this one? Is this a mouse or a rat? If you say yes, what's your confidence level? I would say maybe like 20%, right? But what if I tell you that's the backside of a mouse? Now, next time I ask you, show you the same image. You learned this information, now you know this is a mouse. So that's how machine learning works. All right, guys, you got the session's done. Thank you for joining. Uh, that was a joke. Uh, so why should we care about machine learning? It's all cool, right? But why should I use machine learning? I mean, machines uh, all this work, right? They never sleep. They work 24-7. Nobody has to sit at the desk and type some commands. They just do things on their own. They can do a lot of things beyond human uh, human mind and body capacity. Also, you can take multiple machines and put them together and make like a super, super human specialized machine, which can surpass the capabilities of humans. Also, machines never complain about working hours or working on holidays. All right, so machines also help us when it comes to our health. So machine learning has come so far that machines can actually help you accurately diagnose medical images and, and other diseases. Uh, just take an ex let's take an example of a pathologist. So the job of a pathologist is to scroll through 1,000 photos every 30 minutes. That's one photo every half second. So, so they're trying to go through these images and try to find these anomalies in the pictures, right? So what are the chances they might miss something? Or what are the chances they might misdiagnose something as a disease? Now, machines can actually help you look at the images and double check your work and say, hey, by the way, you might have missed something or this might be a misdiagnosis. If, uh, let's take go back for a second. How do people actually get trained to identify diseases? They actually look at these images and somebody tells them, hey, this is what a disease looks like. This is what an anomaly looks like. What if it's a rare disease you have? How do you train somebody of that? It's almost impossible, right? So, but machines can actually hit their databases, which is as terabytes and terabytes or maybe petabytes of data and they might be able to even help us identify those rare diseases. So machines can actually help us complement or in some cases, you know, do, it, uh, do a much better job at doing some of these things. All right, they also help us with our quality of life. Smart robo, uh, Roomba for vacuuming your house, smartphones, smart sprinklers. You don't have to water when it rains, smart bells and so on. They also help us with our entertainment, Netflix. I'm assuming a lot of you use Netflix, a lot more now than before, but this is not my Netflix, by the way, it's just a screenshot from Google, please don't judge me on this. Uh, but did you know that Netflix actually auto creates thumbnails from the videos, right? You, a lot of you know that. But do you know every time you go in, Netflix might show you a different thumbnail for the same show? Do you know why it does that? So the reason Netflix does that is to try to get your attention, try to make you click it, try to make you watch the series. It's trying to grab your attention. So based on your feedback, if you watch the whole series over a weekend, or maybe you watch like a couple of shows, it kind of learns your behavior to certain kind of images and kind of learns from that. So talking of movies, 
machine learning has come so far that it's actually 97% proficient at reading lips in silent movies versus 67% for humans. Also, machine learning models have been trained which can act accurately reproduce colors from black and white images. Machine learning can also automatically add appropriate environment sounds like a phone ringing or an explosion or traffic and all that. It might sound crazy, but now it's possible to add voice, environmental sounds and dialogue to a silent movie and even colorize the images and make it a colored movie. I think it's mind boggling, by the way. So what has led to all this? So from 2012 to 2019, there has been a 300,000 X increase in the AI compute use. It's AI use, not produced, by the way. So what has led to this? Primarily use of graphic cards. So if, if, you, if some of you guys might know that CPUs have tens of threads. Graphic cards, on the other hand, have thousands of threads. And machine learning scales pretty well on graphic cards. So with, primarily with the use of graphic cards, advancements in cloud technology, now you can do cheaper experiments quicker, so you don't have to buy a bunch of hardware. You can do experiments, shut it down. And also a lot of open source machine learning libraries like TensorFlow, all this is helping with in the advancements of machine learning. Okay, let's talk a little bit about few historical developments in machine learning. All right, computers learn how to identify cats. Why is that important? So historically, we've been actually teaching computers how to identify different things by showing them pictures of different things and labeling them. These are pictures of dogs. These are pictures of cats. These are pictures of tigers. But some researchers from Stanford and Google actually created these unsupervised machine learning models what that means is they only told them how the, what the attributes of cats are. They did not actually show it pictures. So but based on that, it was able to identify cats. On a similar note, machines can see better than humans. What does that mean? So, so there's an uh, ImageNet contest which was launched in 2010. In five years, the accuracy of the winning algorithm increased from 71% to 97% in order to identify images. The best person who, uh, who's really good at this job is only 95% accurate. So the machines are actually more accurate at, than humans at cataloging and at identifying images. Search engine Baidu actually took it one step further by taking the data using the same machine learning models, but taking the data in skewed forms partial, uh, partial uh, pieces of cropping, color, uh, discoloring, it did all that and made it an even better machine learning model. All right, so you might have heard of uh, Deep Blue, a computer that beat Gary Kasparov, the world champion in 1997 of chess. Uh, so here's this guy, Lisa Dole, he is the winner of 18 world titles playing a game called Go from China. Go is a hundreds of year old game. It has been the biggest challenge for AI enthusiasts to crack because of the complexity. Despite decades of work, the strongest Go computers could only play at the level of human amateurs. So they have levels that go from one to nine. So the computer could only play at a level one. Standard algorithm like decision tree, basically trying to identify all the moves you can play at that point, or brute force, try to identify all the things and all the sub, so basically trying to identify your move and the moves next and trying to identify what all you can do in the future, don't work because at any point in time, there are 100,000 moves in Go versus 400 in, in chess. So this uh, needs a lot of infusion, creativity and strategic thinking. So the computer was so good, it actually beat the best player in the world and currently is the best player of Go in the world. Why it was a huge milestone was because the machine actually invented some innovative winning moves. People are actually studying those moves because nobody actually thought that it was wise to play play those moves, but the computer uh, played some remarkable, move, re uh, remarkable moves and people are actually studying those. All right, so machine learning is only, the machine learning model is only as good as the data you use, right? So the economist, in 2017 said that the world's most valuable resource is no longer oil, but data. 
So think of that. So machine learning is based off data. So the more data you have, so think if you're Google or Facebook or Instagram, you have a lot of data on people and now you can actually even build uh, really, really good models. So machine learning models almost become like an intellectual property and a competitive advantage for companies now. So like I said, machine learning models only as good as uh, the data or the code it runs on. So this programmer actually built a, pro a program to play Nintendo games. So the, what the program was doing was looking at the screen and identifying how to increase my score. It knew all the moves, legal moves it could make, what the controller could make. And it was doing pretty well, excuse me, pretty well while playing games. But when they tried to make it play Tetris, the computer program figured the best way to win a Tetris was to hit pause. So mathematically, it's almost impossible. It's impossible to win a Tetris. So the computer figured when it was about to lose, it would just hit pause. That's not what you want, but the computer figured that's the best way to beat the game. All right, so we talked about models, machine learning, algorithm. What does all that mean? So the model is a mathematical structural output of what you're trying to train the computer program to do. Basically, so for machine learning, uh, machine learning algorithms are the engines that derive the model and machine learning uh, frameworks are the libraries or tools that help you build the models easily uh, without having to be a PhD and machine learning frameworks. You can just point your machine learning algorithm at the data and the frameworks do the rest. So they provide a clear and concise way of using them. All right, so what are the different ways in which we can uh, train our machine learning models? So there are basically three types and there are subtypes and sub subtypes, but there's basically three types. One is supervised learning, where you tell the computer, this is what something looks like and it learns to identify similar things or do similar things. Example, image recognition. Second one is unsupervised learning, where uh, you give it some data and it identifies data trends. The third one is reinforcement learning and it's used in things like robotics, where it learns on its own by interacting with the environment. Super, supervised and unsupervised are the most, co most commonly used as they are easier to implement. Reinforcement is a little harder because you have to create your own environment and your own feedback system. All right, so supervised learning, like I mentioned, you know your data, you know the results, and you need, a, need to train your computer or your machine to learn that information. So supervised learning is uh, basically a task in which you know the input, you know the output, you're just tra training the computer to do something similar with newer data. So in other words, you have some labeled data. So in this case, you're trying to teach it how to identify cats, right? So the first one is, like I mentioned, this is classification. So in classification, it's a binary problem, yes or no, true or, true or false, up or down. So in this case, cat or not a cat. All right. So what if you have multiple choices of answers, but you have a series of answers within a range? That's when you use a regression pattern. So in regression, you wanna identify how much would your house sell for right now, or how much would your house sell for a year from now? So what you do is you feed it some historical data, and based on the data, it identifies the patterns like demographics, how's the economy doing, how's the market doing? And it identify and it gives you the the results based on that. Next one is unsupervised learning. In this case, we don't know what the results are. The results are yet to be defined. Unsupervised learning is based off of unlabeled data, so you don't know, so you don't label your data. So it's trying to extract valuable insights from the data, distribution of the data, and correlations and patterns. So what do I mean by all that? So the, one of the ways to do it is by using dimension reduction. So we use dimension redu dimensionality reduction when there's a lot of noise in your data. So think of spam email, for example. There's a bunch of uh, words in the spam. Some actually mean that it's a spam. Some are common words like uh, the, hi, he, she, and so on. So with dimensionality reduction, you try to reduce a lot of things which are noise and do not actually contribute to the model, all these common words. So how it helps is now you actually have lesser number of dimensions or attributes to look at and your machine learning model 
can run faster and you can also fit it into certain machine learning algorithms where it cannot work in that many attributes. So for example, if I were to ask you, uh, I were to create a program to identify paid defects and then on an assembly line, it's hard to define a defect, right? It's hard to define a perfectly painted car, but over time, the program learns by looking at images that this is a perfectly painted car, this is not. All right, um, the next, next technique is called clustering. It's primarily used in things like marketing, for example, you have a bunch of demographic data and other big data on your users. Now you can combine it with some public data lakes and some other uh, data and try to identify how do you create marketing segments for your customers. All right. Uh, so the third one, which is also one of my favorites and we'll dig deeper into which is reinforcement learning. So it is autonomous decision-making by your model uh, in its environment and you actually create a virtual environment and your model is an agent which interacts with the environment and gets feedback. And we'll go a little bit more deeper in detail if all this doesn't make sense. So in this case, the model interacts and gets feedback and learns from um, the environment. For example, a robot with some sensors or a program that plays video games and it's getting some feedback based on the score it's generating. So in this case, let's see, think that your model agent is the car. It's the self-driving car. It can do certain things, right? So it can accelerate, it can brake, uh, it can turn the steering wheel. So in, the, in case of an actual car, you don't wanna take it, so let's say a robot-driven car, you don't wanna take it right on the road and train it on the road, right? So you wanna take it in a virtual environment. So you tr take your model, take it in a virtual environment, it does its training. Once the training is done, it's time to hit the road. Again, when I say hit the road, it's not the actual road, it's probably a train. It's like a controlled simulation or a controlled environment. So now let's say your car is driving on the road. Now, based on the feedback from its sensor, it's trying to run an inference model where it's trying to identify what's happening on the road. What happens if this car merges? What happens if the car in front of me breaks? What if there's a curve? So it's actually, uh, trying to identify what's going to happen next. It's trying to predict, and it's also ready to take an action when that happens. All right, so we talked about three types of machine learning. All right, uh, so, but how do we build the model? You know, how do you do it? So first thing is you want to pick your problem. What is the problem you're trying to fix? Next, you want to see what type of machine learning uh, algorithms you want to use. You could look at Google and you know look at how what how other people are doing it. All right, so then you need some data. You can get uh, data from different sources, like in case of uh, supervised learning, if you're trying to make and identify pictures, you have a bunch of pictures. In case of data, you can grab some big data from your company's uh, data set, or it could be some public data set, census data. There's a lot of public data lakes out there. Uh, I just recently saw that there was a coronavirus database on Amazon Web Services. So there's a lot of data out there for you to use for free. Next, you wanna get your data and clean up the noise so that it's good for machine learning. After that, what you wanna do is train your data. So you set up your training environment, code and configure your machine learning libraries, pick your algorithm, and it's, uh, and you know, once you Google it, it's very straightforward. You have some data, you point your machine learning code to your data and it starts crunching the data. All right, your machine learning um, model is ready. What do you want to do next? Next, you want to evaluate how well it's doing. In case of supervised learning, uh, we set aside some uh, training data for evaluation. So you might have some pictures of cats you have labeled, uh, but you feed it to your model and see what it actually tells you and it kind of evaluates itself. So you can say it's 60% accurate, 70 and so on. Uh, for, in case of unsupervised machine learning, we are identifying new trends so in this case, the best way to do this is actually try it out. Now you can do a few things. You can do, look at the inter, intra-cluster distance to see how close the customers are to each other in case of customer data. And you can also look at how far away are the clusters from each other. So the more the distance, the more distinct the clusters are. All right, so after we are done with this, uh, you wanna evaluate. Uh, so first thing that might happen is your model works really, really well. 
And that's a problem. Why is that a problem? Overfitting is, is modeling error when you actually get some data, but it's too specific to certain types of data and it works really, really well. Uh, let's see an example. So in this case, a uh, model was trained to differentiate between husky dogs and wolves. Which one is husky dog, which one is wolf? I, I forgot, but I'll let you figure it out. So, so when they actually uh, fed it some uh, data set after training the model, it was doing really, really well. But when they introduced new data, they identified that the model really sucked. So why was that? It's because when they took pictures of wolves, they took, them, took the pictures against snow. And when they took pictures of dogs, they were all against grass. So the model was focusing more on the grass versus the snow rather than the facial attributes of the animals. So on the other hand, your model really sucks. It's really, really bad. It's terrible. It's because you did not use a lot of data. You used very small set of data or you did not use the right algorithm. So in this case, we are trying to create a, a banana identifier, oh, sorry, apple identifier and saying this is an apple. Uh, it's terrible. I mean, it's nowhere looks like an uh, apple, nowhere the color, the shape. All right, so how do we fix those issues? So there are a few strategies to fix your uh, issues. The first one is data. You wanna have a variety of data. You wanna have more data so you can actually uh, make your model work better. Next, you wanna research how the other, how are other people in the industry using this? Uh, uh, what uh, algorithms are they using to create these uh, models? Next, there's another technique of using heat map. With the heat map, you can visualize using colors to see where the model, uh, where the machine is focusing on. For example, in this case, we have a, sh have a sheep identifier. So it's focusing on the sheep on the white color. Is that a good model or a bad model? Depends, right? If you're trying to identify white sheep, it's a good model. If you're trying to identify brown sheep, it's a bad model. If you're trying to identify both, it's bad model again. All right, so let's go a little deeper into reinforcement machine learning. So it's typically the least used because it's more, uh, it's very complicated, like I mentioned. Uh, all right, so there's a concept of actions. Like I mentioned briefly, your car can do a few things. It can accelerate, it can brake, it can turn the steering. At any point in time, a combination of all these is called action. And you can define what's the max steering, what is the braking threshold, how much it should brake and so on. Next is the concept of a reward function. It's kind of like rewarding your kids or rewarding your pets, for instance. When they do something good, you reward them with some something good. If they're doing bad, you punish them. So it's similar to that. So when the machine learning algorithm performs something that is a good behavior, you give it, uh, let's say you give it some points, plus one, plus two, plus 10, depends on your algorithm or your function. Or and when it's doing something bad, you want to demote the behavior, so you give it some negative points or lower number of points based on what it's doing. So over time, it identifies what are, what are the good things it should be doing, what, what are the bad behaviors it should be avoiding. So there's also a concept of states and episodes. A state is defined as the current situation of the agent, like what action is taking in the environment, what is its position in right now. So while uh, training, we note uh, what's the current state and multiple states make up the episode. So let's say the car's goal is to go from point A to point B. All the things it does in between make up the episode. All right, for example, the car is in the center of the lane. Is it maintaining an optimal distance? So, so in the episode, you look at things like that by combining all the states together. All right, so there's a concept of exploitation versus exploration. What does that mean? So let's say your car starts learning, right? How to drive. And it figures if it goes too fast, it's veering off in the right lane, it's veering off the road, uh, it's not doing a good job. So it figures if I go really slow, that's perfect, right? I'm getting great points. I mean, I'm getting good points. I mean, it doesn't know it could make, get more points. It just knows it's getting decent points and not getting penalized. So over time, it's just gonna try slow. But do we want that? No, not really. We want it to actually explore. So what you do is with exploration, what you do is uh, when it, uh, 
so you actually add some randomness to it. So you actually force it to take some random decisions. So, and this is a setting in the algorithm. So when the car takes some random uh, actions, it actually figures, hey, I tried this and I actually get more points. So yeah, maybe I should try this. So you're actually promoting it to try new things. There's another concept of a discount factor. It's kind of similar to what we talked earlier. With the discount factor, the future rewards are worth more than the existing rewards. So future rewards might be worth more, 1.1, 1.2 times or whatever, depending on how you define it again. So what it's, uh, what it's doing basically, it's rewarding your each state by making the agent look at the long-term rewards rather than just short-term rewards. So when it knows the future rewards are worth more, it actually tries to complete the episode. Otherwise it'd be like, hey, I tried this. There's a really, really bad curve here. I can never figure out how to navigate that. And then I try to actually get penalized. So maybe I'll just stop there. So with this, you're actually saying, hey, wait a second. If you actually do uh, complete this, you're gonna get more points. So now it's, now it's actually incentivized to keep on going and try to finish the episode. All right, so we talked about a bunch of stuff. We talked about machine learning. We talked about all the different algorithms, all the different models. We talked about reinforcement machine learning. I mean, that's all exciting, but at the same time, it seems pretty daunting, right? I was in the same boat as you guys. Uh, I had read a bunch of articles, gone through a bunch of videos, but st still seemed pretty hard you know, to get in. That's when I came across uh, AWS DeepRacer. So AWS DeepRacer, according to me, is one of the fastest ways to get into reinforcement machine learning. So I was at the AWS conference and I came across these people are driving, at that time I thought were remote driven cars. I'm like, what's the big deal? You know, there's a track and they're just driving the car across the track. Once uh, I, once it told me it's actually driving by itself, that piqued my curiosity. And then I saw like you actually train it virtually in a virtual environment, take a USB, download the model, plug it into the car, and then it drives itself on the track. I'm like, man, mind blown, that's awesome. So that's when I really uh, dug deeper and I wanna share my journey with you guys today. Uh, in order to get started, uh, you, want, uh, you need an AWS web service account. Um, uh, I'm sure some of you already have it. If not, I would say creative account. If you wanna take a picture or a screenshot of this, uh, go ahead. These are a couple of links, which would be really handy for you to get started. Uh, so initially they give you eight to nine hours of free uh, machine learning training. So what AWS does is it uh, gets these, so you create a model and it all automatically gets these uh, machines with the really cool graphic cards and all those high, high speed memory machines and it utilizes them and uses a bunch of services to train a model. All right, so going back, so let's talk about a few services it uses. One of the services it uses is Amazon uh, SageMaker. It's Amazon's uh, machine learning platform. All right, so you will also be doing a little bit of Python code. Uh, if, you are, if you don't know any Python, don't worry about it. It, it also comes with predefined templates you can use uh, you can t tweak it a little bit if you want to do, or if you want to write it from scratch, you can do all that. Uh, there's a flexibility of that. So let's talk about the system for a second. So you have a track and then you have a car. So initially it's a virtual car and a virtual track. So your car interacts with the learning system. You can choose from a bunch of tracks. Um, so AWS takes care of all this. So as it's training, at every state, uh, it's getting uh, some feedback from the environment and it's getting rewards. Rewards could be negative or positive. So the cool thing is you don't have to set everything up. It's already predefined for you. That's the best part about this. All right, so how does the car learn? So car learns uh, this PPO algorithm, which is proximal policy op optimization, and you can Google it. I'm not an expert at machine learning, but yeah. You can Google it and find out more about this. I'm really good at this. If you have any questions about DeepRacer, I'm really good at that. And then it creates these two neural networks. By neural networks, what I mean is they're similar to how our brains work, how the neurons are connected to each other. You make a decision, you make a sub-decision and so on. And finally, you make a final decision on what to do at any point in time. So at any point in time, it tries to identify what action to take, right? Initially, just uh, randomly tries to identify what actions to take, and over time, it actually builds its reward, func uh, 
it builds its uh, reward policy. It figures out how to make better decisions. So first you create a model and now they introduce new model types. So there's a time trial where you're trying to uh, complete the track in a minimum amount of time. And there's an object avoidance where there are static objects. And then there's head-to-head -head racing as well. So you're racing against other vehicles on the on the track. So now you're, you have to decelerate, you have to do multiple things. And this also uses a new type of car which has additional sensors. And I'll talk about the sensors in a little bit. Next, you uh, have a virtual track. So in the virtual track, you have a dotted line in the center, white borders on the side, and the goal of the car is to stay within the borders. And you have 10 tracks to choose from. Next, we have input parameters. So with the input parameters, it's basically telling you the state of the car at any point in time. What is the position? Where is it heading? Uh, also things like what is the width of the track? What is the speed? What is the steering angle and so on? So let's look. Uh, go through a few of them. Speed is pretty straightforward. What is the angle uh, the car is uh, currently at compared to the center of the track? What is the width of the track? It's pretty. Uh, it's static right now, but in the future they might change. Make it variable. Variable width. Distance from the center. Are all the wheels on the, on the track or not? If the car goes out outside the track, it gets reset and starts training again. So the episode ends right there. All right. So next, we want to set up your model actions. What is the maximum steering angle? And what is the maximum speed? Also, you, there's a thing called granularity. What do I mean by that? What are the variations? So in this case, we have the maximum angle of 10 degrees. So it can do minus 10, 0, and plus 10. So max speed is 2. So it can go at 1 meter per second and 2 meter per second because of the granularity. Next, we look at all the actions. Like I mentioned, actions are combination of all the things it can do at any point. So three variations, uh, three variations in the uh, angles and two variations in the speed. Three multiplied by two is six. So six actions from starting from zero to five. All right. So next, we uh, it gives you the ability to pick from some sample code. First one, pretty straightforward. Follow the central line. Second one is stay within the border, so you have some flexibility of moving around. Uh, third one is prevent zigzag. Don't drive like a drunk, dri drunk driver. All right, or you can write your own code. Like I mentioned, you don't have to do it. You can just pick the code. I'm just breaking it down so you can understand it better. First, you define your reward function and it takes a bunch of parameters like we saw earlier. Next, you read the input parameters and some variables. So like distance from the center and the track width. Next, you wanna say, if it's near the center, I wanna give it more rewards. If it's, uh, further away and you define how much distance. I want to give it less rewards and if it goes outside, it just gets reset and gets no points or no rewards. So this is how it kind of looks like visually. If you're wondering if it's near the center, two points, point two, and outside it gets reset. All right, next you want to trade your model. So you basically go in AWS, um, AWS DeepRacer and say, I want to train my model for X number of minutes and then it starts training. I would recommend at least training it for 30 minutes to an hour. You can go as far as eight, I think eight hours for each model. All right, so once it's training, this is what it kind of looks like. All right, one second. Uh, it might be choppy for you guys uh, because I'm streaming, but you get the idea. So initially, if you see the model is just trying new things, but as you can see, it actually knows pretty well how to navigate around the, around the track. So earlier what it was doing was it was doing this uh, thing called exploration where it's trying random things. But now it's actually using most of the stuff it learned and it can navigate the track pretty well. All right, uh, next, let's look at the heat map. So with the heat map, as you can see, as it's approaching a turn and it's near the left, side of the track, it's focusing a lot on that curve, especially that corner. It's trying to avoid that. It knows it's gonna penalize if it actually goes out. Similarly, when it's on the right side of the track, it focuses on the right border. So it's identifying which things are really important for it. Also, you can visually see as you, as you train your model, you see the reward graph. It's actually going up, right? So typically it should go up. If it's not going up, sloping up, you probably wanna change some things. 
or your model's too aggressive or some of the parameters are not right. But if you use like a default um, reward function and do uh, smaller changes to it, it should work pretty well. Next, once your model's ready, you can race against others. Uh, in the current environment, there's no physical races going on, but you can actually participate in online races where you can, every 30 minutes, you can pick your model and choose a track you wanna train it on, uh, you wanna compete in. Also, as you can see, it has a bunch of sensors, camera, USB, it runs Ubuntu, ROS Kinetic, a bunch of stuff. I'm not gonna go through all of that. Like I mentioned, they also have a new hardware where it has a LiDAR sensor, so it can detect 360 degrees if a car is coming behind it. Also, it has stereo cameras to for obstacle avoidance. All right, uh, and it used to have three layers, now it has a five layer. It just means it has a more much deeper learning model. Uh, this is what it actually looks like on the actual physical track. So as you see, the models, so this is one of the top 10 models of, at that time. But you might see, you might expect it to just hug the center line, right? It's not. Why is that? It's because, first of all, it's trained in its actual virtual environment. Lighting is perfect. Whatever the friction is, it's perfect. There's no, so, but in the actual environment, as you see, there's shadows, the lighting is different, and it's, it's figuring out which way the track turns and things are different, right, in the physical world. So machine learning uh, reinforcement works really well here because it's trying to identify things to do here. And over time, it's gonna get really, really good. All right, uh, next, uh, let's talk a little bit about how do you take your learning a little further? So you can look at AWS. Azure has machine learning studio and Google has a cloud machine learning engine. Watson has IBM Watson. So there's a bunch of technologies out there you can use to uh, take it further and do some more experimentation. Also, I highly recommend some courses. Uh, my favorites are udemy.com. They have like $10 courses and edx.org. They have a lot of free courses out there. Uh, if you wanna take it a little, little bit further, there's R, Python. Uh, you might wanna learn some SQL if you don't already. There's some machine learning libraries, TensorFlows. Scikit, PyTorch, you can get into mathematics, uh, algebra, calculus, also deeper statistics stuff, which I don't even know how to pronounce. All right, anyways, I really appreciate you guys taking the time and choosing to come to this session. Hopefully you learned something cool. Here is my contact information. If you have any questions, I'm willing to take them now, as well as afterwards on through email or LinkedIn. Thank you guys. Well, thank you, Harnor. We sure appreciate it. Uh, do you want to stop? Here? What was that? Oh, okay. Sure. Excellent. Um, we don't have any immediate questions, uh, at least from the channels I'm seeing. Okay. Um, if you have any, please. I. That's like the be that's the best feedback, right? <laughs> uh, and yeah, uh, and go over people's head, and you know they're like, "Man, this thing is hard." Well, Hopefully not. I say that. Uh, no, I, I don't. I don't think it did. Uh, specifically, though, when you've given this talks previously, what's one of the most asked questions that you usually get? Uh, so a lot of time, people ask, uh, "How can they get started?" They have so they've worked with something similar, right? Or they're exploring machine learning. So a lot of questions are around that topic. So for example, like how do you use that Quicken Loan? So I can give you guys a few examples. So we use a lot of supervised machine learning models. So we, I don't know if you guys know, but we are mostly online. People call in to us or go to our website or download the app, Rocket Mortgage, and interact with us using that, right? But we can always do better. So we get a ton of like millions of leads and we only convert like a fraction of them. I can't talk about what number, but a fraction of them. Now our goal is to try to make it better, right? Because we spend a lot of time talking to people. Uh, there's a lot of, uh, so we wanna make sure we talk to the people which we have a higher chance of converting to our actual customers, right? So we use machine learning and look at historical data and identify certain patterns, not only in the clients, but also our bankers. We've noticed, like we've used things like uh, 
speech to text, and then we uh, we run machine learning models on that, and identify if you use certain keywords, people actually have a higher chance of converting. It's a simple thing, right? But when you're uh, looking at millions and millions of uh, uh, clients, it's hard to do it manually. So machine learning helps us with that. Also, looking at historically, uh, we have certain things like refinance. You you're either you already have a mortgage and you're trying to refinance, or you are purchasing a new house. So we can actually use our algorithms to further uh, dive deeper into that and see this client should go to this banker, for example. This will be so. So so there are a few things we can do, uh, and it's actually helping uh, increase our conversion rate and help us generate more revenue without having to spend a ton of money. Okay, thank you. Uh, we had some come in. Uh, okay, mm -hmm. so. Uh, what personal machine learning project has been the most interesting for you? So not non-professional related. Okay. Uh, so right now, I mostly have experience with the deep racer. Uh, I, I am working on one which actually uses cryptocurrency data and it tries to figure out what the value of the cryptocurrency is going to be going forward. That's the one I'm really, really interested in. Uh, unfortunately, I had some roadblocks. I'm trying to figure out some technical issues with that. Uh, so these are a couple of things I would say. Gotcha. Um, can we train machines to do the reward function for other machines to remove the human element? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, I'll, if you can give me their contact, I can. I know people who are really, really experienced with this, and I can get you that information. I don't know this answer right now. Gotcha. Well, we'll be sure to follow up on on Slack. Yep. Um, one one more. Uh, I often read and watch about machine learning and how we can make them the best they possibly can. However, in video games, it is often necessary to have multiple versions of an AI to play. How might we train a model to play just okay, not perfectly, in order to be more human? So, not looking for absolute hundred percent. You know high scores, more just middling AI. Oh, okay. Uh, one of the ways, easier way, a lot of, uh, uh, what, what should I say? Models do that is by limiting certain actions. Because uh, if machines can take all the actions a normal player can t take, they would be much, much better. So you can limit certain actions in the game. That's how you limit how well they play. Other things you can do is tweak the algorithms a little bit. Uh, you can tweak the reward function a little bit, but that's the easiest way. Just limit. You cannot take these actions together or a combination of these actions. I mean, I play, for example, I play Rocket League, which is a video game where you play, you are driving a car and you're playing soccer. So now I can actually fly the car in the air using a rocket boost, but the AI cannot. I can't even imagine if the AI could actually fly, like how superhuman they would be. So that's just an example. Uh, do you play 1v1, 2v2? What's your, what's your uh, I'm, I'm a 2v2 player. Okay. Primarily. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, sorry, I moved Twitch to a second computer. Um, okay. Yep. Sorry. Uh, in your experience, when do you decide to optimize machine learning models by re-implementing it in another language instead of your so, example, like re-implementing it in, in, in C++ rather than in Python. Oh, okay. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't have the answer, but again, I can get back to you. Uh, I'll reach out to our, so we have a whole team that's dedicated to machine learning and uh, building these models. So, like I said, I'll get you the answer, I promise, yeah. uh, but uh, I don't have it at this point. To clarify it just a little bit, how often do you see, like, re-changing re languages? Uh, so, so with the cloud technology, it's not that important which language you use because you can, if, if something's running slow, uh, right. you can either change your algorithm or you can just throw pro more processing power. So that's not that. So our main uh, thing is we don't want to introduce too much, right? Like somebody's using Python, somebody's using Java, somebody's using C++, and now if somebody else is going to work on it, there's no uniformity. So we try to work mostly with Python and just throw more processing power or change the algorithm. So that's our primary thing we do, but there could be cases where you just have to, this thing is like 90% slow, so you might wanna do it in that case. What a save. 
All right. Well, uh, I think that's going to be it for this. Uh, again, Hanar, we could not thank you enough for doing this. This is a fantastic talk. Uh, I, <laughs> having been through a couple of machine learning talks before, it definitely is less head scratchy than the others. So I definitely appreciate that. That's a that is a tough subject to tackle, and you've done it with with uh, grace. So um, yep. again, uh, if you have any additional questions, anyone for him. Uh, just send it, send it on, and we'll make sure they get to him and he can answer them. So, uh, real quick, where can everybody learn more about you? Uh, they can reach out to my LinkedIn. It's Harnoor Minhas. Just search my name, H A R N O O R M I N H A S, and you should be able to find me. Perfect. I appreciate it. Have a good one. All right. Thank you, guys. It was a pleasure.